So with that said, moving forward on, you know, with an intersectional mindset, the civil rights movement, right? It, it's with its connections to broader organizing at the time. Um, and the anti-war movement was, you know, pretty, you know, fully interconnected with the civil rights movement, right? Um, these weren't, while they were their own movements, they were also very much interconnected, very much collaborating, very much cooperating, very much, you know, sharing activist organizers and thinkers. Um, and the same with, you know, the feminist movement, the rising LGBTQIA movement. Um, and they offer the civil rights movement, you know, of the 60s, you know, from the 50s, 70s, um, you know, casting a broader, a broader net, you know, offers a historical moment of upheaval and radicalism that can serve as an example of intersectional left organizing in the U.S., right? Which I think is important. As, as citizens in the U.S., like, as a leftist organizer, it can be very, very demoralizing to kind of think about our conditions and our history, right? Because there's not... Our, the history of movements in the United States is getting sucked into the Democratic Party and dying, right? Um, you know, it's getting co-opted, right? And um, it's getting, you know, sold out. Um, and so it's important to look at, you know, at, look at this moment in history that like, you know, when we talk about Marxism wasn't simply a one shot that, that was an end state, it, it, it continues today. <clears throat> and we'll talk about it some of it there. But, you know, a big one is the Black Panther Party, right? Um, there's a Black Panther Party's 10 point program. Um, when we get to the history section, I've got another you know, a book about the Black Panther Party in there. Um, you, some major thinkers like Stokely Carmichael, Angela Davis, Fred Hampton, right? Um, <clears throat> and in the case of like Fred Hampton, we're talking about a major figure that was active for a very short amount of time, right? You know, I, I'm not sure from when he stepped onto the scene to when he was murdered, but it was not a long time, right? So he had a huge impact in the short amount of time. Um, you know, Malcolm X, MLK, right? MLK is often very much whitewashed, um, but there's a very radical MLK that's in there. Um, there's a very, you know, there's a very radical um, MLK that was really rising when he was you know, assassinated. Um, yeah. I think I, his legacy would be far different had he lived a few more decades. Yeah, I, I threw in the letter from Birmingham jail there as as kind of a very... Um, a good read if you haven't read it before because it it's it kind of shows you that that radical king that often gets very hidden <laughs> when when today's capitalist society you know has Martin Luther King Day and has all the you know thank you Dr King stuff up and all they leave out his criticisms of today's system beyond just the racism of capitalism and all and what you see in that letter is a critique that you know as much as he's fighting racism. Some of his biggest frustrating moments are dealing with uh, white moderates um, who say that, you know, oh, we, you know, we support civil rights and all, but, you know, maybe now's not the time. Maybe we got to wait for this a little bit. Maybe if you try it later, I don't know, you're being a little bit strong right now, you know, and, and he expressed his frustration with that system that they're trying to set. I, I always like the quote of um, the set a timetable for another man's freedom. Um, and that's kind of what the system does, that even when, say, the Democratic Party says they support civil rights, LGBTQ rights or whatever, it's on their timetable. It's on capitalism's timetable. Um, and it's, it's within that very narrow um, capitalist patriarchal sort of point of view um, to where they, they, they have to kind of make it acceptable to the ruling class, right, instead of actually granting the full freedom and liberation, which is what they're actually asking and, and fighting for. Um, so, you know, not only does, does Martin Luther King express that in this letter, but, but his, his later writings and speeches expressed, you know, how he felt increasingly because of, um, the moderating influence of the duopoly that he needed to take a much stronger, uh, democratic socialism take in his speeches and all. And, um, I forget exactly which one it was, but I know he, he, uh, started talking more about the need for an independent political party to express those things, um, and you know that's that's really when uh, when when um, it shifted to kind of the um, 
the the poverty march, right? The million man march and stuff like that. Um, seeing it uh, intersectionally, right, with through, with class and and race and um, all of these issues coming together. So um, those are great reads if you haven't seen the the Radical King and not just the one that's presented to us. <laughs> yeah, and another great uh, you know idea that I think is extremely applicable to modern organizing from that letter to, from Birmingham Jail. <laughs> is the idea of a negative peace versus a positive justice, right? Um, Garrett Gray says he thinks you're talking about the evils of three evils of society speech. Um, but in, you know, back to what I was saying, the King kind of counterbalances these two ideas um, of a negative peace, right? Where you shut up about being oppressed and we don't have to deal with it, right? Um, get over it, struggle through it, right? Um, and and that how that that negative piece really appeals, you know, to liberals and to moderates um, who who want to to look at tokenism, right? And say, well, we we've got women as the the leaders of all the the uh, of, of the majority of the weapons dealers, right? <laughs> of the of the um, military industrial complex companies. So that's progress, right? It, it, it's just trading, um, that they're happy to trade a, uh, diverse oppressor, right. And, and call it good and just shut up about the rest. Cause look, they gave you a diverse, you know, so they elevated someone to the top as opposed to a positive justice, which is what peace was, you know, what, what King and the movement were fighting for, um, where, where we get live, where there's liberation, right. There's actual justice. There's, there's positive engagement with the uh, with the problems and, and working towards solutions. So yeah, that's another big one. Um, kind of you know, trailing on or tagging on to uh, the kind of switch in the later King that uh, Garrett was talking about right there. Right, um, there's a book called This Non Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. It's there somewhere. By Charles Cobb Jr. Um, that um, takes a, I think is important an important read um, for Greens um, and for for independent socialists um, because it's made, it's about how guns and weapons and violence um, made the civil rights movement possible. Um, Ward Churchill, who is a a narcissistic asshole, I've met him. Um, He's not a pleasant person, uh, but he wrote a brilliant essay called Pacifism as Pathology, um, where he goes into this same kind of idea that um, without Malcolm, without Fred, um, King would have been stomped down like previous attempts at, at liberation, right? Um, because there were there were more um, you know aggressive elements to the civil rights movement because it was a, a, a multi pronged movement. King was able to say deal with me or you get Malcolm, right? <laughs> deal with me or you get Fred. Um, so this nonviolent stuff will get you killed, I think, is a really important read for Greens um, so that and independent socialists. So we kind of have, a, have an understanding of, you know, what nonviolence means and how it differs from pathological pacifism, which is no violence at any time, right? Because that no violence at any time ignores the fact that violence is a natural part of the world of everyday life, right? It's not something that I, I, I necessarily think will ever just go away, right? The, and not just talking physical violence, but all kinds of violence, right? So I think it's important. that's an important book that can help us have a larger context of how the dynamics of that movement, of the civil rights movement worked, right? Um, how did, how the, it's the three main, you know, groups we've got here, right? How did the Black Panther Party, Malcolm X and Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. all fit into their different slots, right? How did they play different roles? How did they, um, you know, move things in different ways? How did they play each other, you know, off each other positively and negatively, right? Um, as, a, as socialists, this is something we should look at, right? Not just the theories, but the interactions and, um, and, and the intersectionality of it, like we said. Um, I do want to jump back because in mode... Emoji said, I appreciate the analytical lens of intersectionalism, but also seeing simplistic understandings of it leading to people think that the replacement of a white, of 
thinking that the replacement of white straight men in organizations is as substantial progress, right? I, I kind of got into that with um, talking about tokenism and women CEOs of, of uh, defense contractors, right? Um, but that is a problem, right? That's come with um, the rise in popularity of intersectionality, especially among, you know, liberals, um, where they are looking for tokenism, right? They're looking for, um, you know, a liberalized vision of diversity. Um, they aren't looking for empowerment. They aren't looking for liberation, right? Um, I, I also think a major problem that's come up with, you know, the rise of popularity and inter intersectionality in, you know, recent years, decade, a couple decades is that oftentimes class is forgotten as one of these identities, right? Um, that it's like, it, it foc focuses really hard into racial or gender or sexuality or ability or, you know, education levels or, you know, things like that. But class isn't often kept up on that same level, right? It, it's a rejection of class reductionism, but it's not re a rejection of class is a very real thing. And I don't think, uh, you know, the, the Kimberly Crenshaw or any of the original, um, you know, users of the, the term would see it that way, right? And I, I think that's one thing that has happened, right? Is we've, we've stopped making sure that class is spread throughout our intersectionality, right? In many ways, um, for most people, you know, looking at this, this kind of um, the, the Venn diagram in the picture, class is kind of a picture, a circle that encompasses almost all of them, right? In one way or the other, whether it's a, um, whether it's a privilege from class or whether it's an oppression from class or whether it's a mixed bag from class, right? Um, no matter who you are, no matter what class you represent, um, it, it comes into play. Um, so I think that a big part of what Emoji is talking about, is, uh, one of the big problems is that we've excluded class. Um, and I think a part of that is because it's been adopted as a, a ideal for promoting tokenism and liberal diversity by you know liberals who don't want to talk about class. They don't. They want to talk about the middle class, maybe, but they don't want to talk about you know capitalist classes. Um, they don't want to get into oh, yeah. that deep conversation. It's much easier to you know. It, it's kind of like what libertarians did to the word libertarian, mm -hmm. right? It, libertarian was coined by an anti-capitalist, uh, uh, Proudhon, and he it was anti-state and anti-capital. And American libertarians have removed the anti-capitalist part. Right, and they've only identified with the anti-state. And in many ways, liberal liberal intersectionalists have done the same thing, where they've adopted this idea, which it has value of, you know, the interaction of identity, but they have excised class as one of those identities. Um, and by doing so, they've really undermined the entire system to a point that it's not about liberation and empowerment, which is what we want when we're talking about it. Um, it, it becomes about tokenism and, and you know, diversity quotas, um, which gets into the problem that emerging yeah. brought up. But I did yeah. want to jump back and, and get yeah. that. Yeah, uh, if I could throw in just one kind of yeah. uh, comment real fast, uh, related to the class thing, uh, one of my uh, earliest criticisms that I had when Bernie Sanders started running for president was he talked about a lot of really good issues, for example, healthcare. But every speech he made was about, you know, bringing up the middle class. And um, that's always been kind of a problem here the, that um, even the most progressive and even the most socialist sounding politicians like Bernie Sanders have uh, kind of ignored this whole class structure. And instead of questioning the class structure itself, and, uh, you know, the struggle between working class people as a whole versus the capitalists who claim to own everything. Here's Bernie propping up that the, having a middle class, which implies that there's upper and lower and all right, is OK as long as the middle class gets health care and stuff. And that, you know, that's not enough. Right. <laughs> like when we're talking about liberation for everyone and moving toward an eco-socialist society, uh, we have to address the whole class structure itself um, and not just you know, problems with certain parts of certain classes or whatever. And of course, d diving deeper into that um, class means, uh, you know, not only uh, socioeconomic things, but, you know, race, gender, and uh, disability and all the stuff we've been talking about. 
uh, play into all of that. So it's it's a complex problem that gets papered over by this liberal politics. Yeah, and, and the Democratic Party is happy to fight, ha happy to, to be sequestering, you know, its fight with the Republicans on identity issues, on social issues, right? Um, and uh, avoiding real talks about class and capitalism, right? Um, I'm, I'm not a, one of the people that says there's no difference between the two parties, because on some issues there very much clearly is. Um, but when it comes to capitalism, when it comes to class, when it comes to, you know, big picture economics, um, they're very happy to avoid those things because they're very much on the same, you know, the same page, like Garrett was pointing out with uh, the example of Bernie. Um, you know, so I, the civil rights movement, it, it seems cliche, right, to, to make sure we, it, that this is centered, but it really was a moment in our history, right? And we can, there were other moments, right, the late 1800s and the early 1900s before the Red Scare, right, um, with the, the Haymarket, you know, um, affair in Chicago and, you know, Emma Goldman and Eugene Debs and all this kind of stuff, right? There were, there were other moments, but um, this is probably the most recent real intersectional moment that we've had. Um, and a, a quick plug here that um, uh, our previous Green Party 101 streams uh, dive into this a little bit more, but kind of uh, out of the civil rights movement from the 60s, um, through the 60s, 70s, into the 80s, is essentially where the Green Party came from because the civil rights movement and anti-war and all of these groups were largely absorbed into the Democratic Party at this point in time, um, which meant that all of these issues stopped being addressed. The Democrats, uh, you know, co-opted them and then shut it down. And so there was a real uh, uh, need for uh, a new independent party to represent all of these things. And the, you know, the anti-war civil rights uh, feminism and uh, environmental movements and all came together, and and that was the the birth of the Green Party in the early 1980s.